this is in the early part of the 20th century, that the 20th century problems are different. And that what the 20th century needs is some way uh, that is neither socialism uh, nor uh, laissez-faire. Uh, and especially what the 20th century needs are institutions which are intermediate between the individual and the state, as if such things didn't exist in the uh, 19th century. Uh, but I think uh, Keynes argument is instructive uh, because uh, his argument about liberalism I think exactly the opposite of the truth. Uh, the state um, and status ideology um, prefers either the isolated individual or failing that, it prefers the dominant, uh, domination of non-government institutions uh, by the state. And the examples, the three examples that I'm going to uh, give now are widely um, uh, um, s um, spread out in history uh, and very different examples, uh, but all of which uh, show uh, the problems that the state finds or has with uh, the institutions of civil society and how the state tries to uh, eliminate the independence of those institutions. Uh, I think that the, the reason for studying this, and the reason I think these examples are instructive, is because they turn our attention to the ways in which, in today's world, uh, the state has tried to uh, uh, weaken or eliminate uh, the institutions of civil society, and by so doing, has really uh, tried to um, weaken uh, the uh, case uh, for liberalism. Because if the, in, if, the, 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 if the individual or if the citizen has to choose between an isolated, atomistic state uh, of affairs, he himself alone, uh, versus state control, uh, the social nature of individuals will propel them most likely to uh, state control. So this is a very important issue. Okay, I have on the board uh, the the three examples, uh, or at least the key words of the three examples. Uh, the first one has to do with the uh, correspondence in the sense of an exchange of letters uh, between um, the Roman uh, ge uh, uh, gentleman and uh, governor uh, Pliny the Younger and the emperor at the time uh, of the beginning of the second century AD, the Emperor Trajan. Now, uh, both Pliny uh, the Younger and the Emperor Trajan uh, have reputations of being very wise, honest, and uh, decent people. Um, and they were trying to grapple with a, a problem, uh, and a very, in some ways, mundane problem. Around 110 AD, Pliny was appointed by the Emperor, um, the uh, appointed uh, governor of the Roman province uh, Bithynia Pontus, which is in Asia Minor, now uh, Turkey. And this was the, the problem that Pliny uh, faced. And uh, I should add, Pliny was very cautious. He didn't like to make decisions without checking with his superiors. And in this case, it was the emperor. And his whole political career, uh, it was based on this cautious approach to uh, those in authority. So. At one point, uh, in one of the cities uh, in, in Bithynia, uh, there was a major fire that caused uh, extensive damage. And Pliny concluded that the damage would, have been, uh, would not have been so great had the people been better organized uh, to fight fires. So he writes a letter to the Emperor Trajan. And this is what he says in the letter, or some of the things he says in the letter. I have to just add as a side point, uh, in high school I had to read the letters of Pliny the Younger and I thought it was the most boring, horrible thing. It turns out that uh, Pliny had some interesting points, which just that we never read the interesting letters. We, uh, um, but in any event, uh, this is what Pliny writes to uh, the Emperor Trajan. It is generally agreed uh, that people stood watching the disaster, the fire disaster, without bestirring themselves to do anything to stop it. Apart from this, there is not a single fire engine anywhere in the town, not a bucket, nor, an appropriate, nor any appropriate apparatus for fighting a fire. So uh, Pliny decides to make a suggestion to the emperor. He asks him this question. Would you, uh, will you consider 
whether you think a company of firemen might be formed, limited to 150 members, I will see that no one shall be admitted who is not genuinely a firefighter, and that privileges granted shall not be abused. It will not be difficult to keep such small numbers under observation. You know, there's something strange going on here, right? He's not simply asking, uh, suggesting to set up a fire department, but he's trying to allay the emperor's fears about something. And I think it becomes clearer when you hear the emperor's uh, response. So Trajan says the following to him. I have received your suggestion that it should be possible to form a company of firemen in Nicomedia, that's the name of the city uh, in the province, on the model of those existing elsewhere. But we must remember that it is societies like these which have been responsible for political disturbances in your province, particularly in its cities. Now this is the key sentence, I think. If people assemble for a common purpose, whatever name we give them, and for whatever reason, they soon turn into a political club. It is better policy then to provide the equipment necessary for dealing with the fires and to instruct the property owners to make use of it, calling upon the help of crowds which collect if they find it necessary." End quote. So Trajan is worried about simply establishing a fire department. And his worry is that any organization of people can easily turn to political purposes. Now, Trajan's fear is well justified, uh, apparently. Um, apparently, in this province, uh, there were associations in the past, uh, originally organized for non-political purposes, uh, that led to political uh, trouble. And, and this has all happened throughout the empire. Uh, and in the later days of the republic and in the empire, uh, all uh, clubs and organizations were subject to a system of licensing. Um, and so uh, the, uh, the emperor wanted to know what clubs were being formed, where, and to have them uh, officially licensed or sanctioned under certain conditions. There is additional evidence, apparently, uh, having to do with uh, placards um, that were um, um, uh, made by clubs of, uh, uh, ostensibly brought together for professional interests. Uh, apparently there were located uh, uh, placards of uh, fruit dealers, okay, clubs of fruit dealers uh, here, who, who urged the election of certain people to various positions within the province. Uh, there were uh, associations of goldsmiths, uh, so association of worshippers of Isis, the goddess Isis, um, who urged the election of certain candidates. So it, it turns out that uh, clubs, uh, uh, organizations established for any purpose under the sun, uh, seem to have, in due course, uh, turned to political uh, purposes. And so the emperor uh, Trajan, uh, I think from his own point of view, was right in being suspicious of any kinds of organizations that were independent of the state. Uh, I should add that the uh, attitude of the, of the Roman, uh, of Trajan and uh, later Roman emperors uh, toward the Christians uh, was, was related to all of this. Uh, the problem with Christianity from the Roman point of view was not uh, that they worshipped uh, Jesus or, uh, 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 or different God, but that they refused to worship also uh, the Roman gods. Um, that they believed in some sort of exclusive truth uh, of their own god. Uh, it, makes, it, may, it makes it sound like the Romans are broad-minded in a way, but the point is that uh, the, uh, the organization, the religion in the empire uh, and in the republic as well, had an important civic function. Uh, and uh, to have a religion uh, that uh, did not partake of that civic function uh, was a threat to the uh, stability, uh, the political stability uh, of, the, of the Roman Empire. Okay, the second example uh, is it been in the news recently, and I, I hope uh, that there are no Chinese students here, not because I don't like Chinese students, but because certainly the if there's a Chinese student here, he'll know more about this than I know. So um, uh, I would prefer there not be one. Um, but there is a, um, 
Uh, there has been in the news recently uh, reports about this organization called uh, Falun Gong. Um, and as I understand it, it's a, a, a spiritualist movement. It combines elements of uh, Buddhism and Taoism and certain types of uh, exercises. Uh, um, it has certain uh, recommendations uh, uh, that have to do uh, with health uh, without the use of um, uh, med medical uh, um, procedures uh, through meditation and exercise. Um, and that they have been subject to criticism by the, uh, uh, the Chinese government. Uh, but what was the real problem is not so much the earlier criticism by the Chinese government of this movement, but that when the movement decided to protest uh, the Chinese government's uh, criticism of them, uh, they demonstrated to the government that they had a great deal of uh, power in terms of organizing people and getting them to uh, uh, together for a, a, s a specific purpose. Um, and so the ability of this organization simply to mobilize large groups of people uh, and to uh, protest uh, the criticism by the government and to demand official recognition, again, uh, an, an aspect taken uh, or similar to the to the Roman situation where organizations that are not part of the state are uh, uh, supposed to be sanctioned or licensed by the state when they organized in order to demand this uh, the government saw what power they have had and have uh, and became frightened about the political implications now an article that I have here from the New York Times says and I don't know how accurate this is in terms of Chinese history but this is what the New York Times says. It says, mindful of the explosive role that groups invoking mystical forces have played in toppling weak authorities in transitional, at transitional periods throughout Chinese history, government leaders have, con have conducted a campaign against Falun Gong with, the, with market thoroughness. Again, what we have is an example of um, an organization which if we accept for the sake of argument, is not directly a political organization, nevertheless posing a threat to the state because of its very power to organize people and to command their uh, loyalties. Again, a, uh, a kind of um, uh, confirmation of the Emperor Trajan's um, uh, position or opinion that organizations formed for any purpose can easily turn to political purposes and create uh, instability. Now, excuse me. After giving those two rather dramatic examples, or three if you count the Christians, um, uh, people may uh, think that the next example is kind of absurd, and that is American universities. Um, now, I obviously recognize that there is a difference between the state's influence of American private universities and what the state uh, d did in the case of uh, the Emperor Trajan and the fire department and the uh, registration of groups in the empire and the treatment of the Christians and the treatment of the Chinese government of the uh, Falun Gong leaders. And, um, uh, but I think that it's important to see that those extreme cases uh, also uh, provide a model for the tendency, even, even though it may be exercised in a weaker way, that exists uh, in, uh, even in an apparently uh, free and uh, uh, a diverse society as the United States. Now, what am I talking about when I talk about American universities uh, and their relationship uh, to the state? I mean American private universities, so-called private universities. Uh, one of the things that got me thinking about this uh, issue um, uh, was an article that appeared again in the New York Times uh, a few days ago, really, um, on the lobbying efforts uh, that uh, uh, American universities are making uh, in order to get money for research expenses, uh, research expenditures. Uh, typically, uh, how a university, a private university, gets research money in the United States is through two, primarily through two government agencies. One, the National Science Foundation, 
and the other the National Institutes of Health. Now there are others, but these constitute the lion's share of the resources available for research. And uh, the process is that uh, there are committees uh, in, uh, of supposed experts uh, in various academic fields who then decide uh, which grants uh, uh, get funded and which grants uh, uh, do not. But more recently, what has happened is that uh, pr uh, private universities especially, and but others as well, have found it easier to go directly to Congress for special appropriation for their university, special projects at their university, and to bypass all of the professional review that has been set up in order to supposedly ensure that the money uh, is, spent, uh, is spent wisely. So what is happening increasingly um, is that universities are spending money uh, on uh, um, organizations uh, that, uh, who, whose task it is to uh, lobby uh, Congress. Now, what I mean by lobby, in case people are not familiar with that, uh, that term, is that uh, you pay an organization, a university pays an organization, a professional organization, which then goes around to the key congressman and makes the case uh, to those congressmen who are on special committees that are concerned with education or funding, uh, why your university should get X millions of dollars for a specific research project. And uh, it's increasingly the case that universities are spending a lot of money on this. Uh, the Times reported uh, uh, that the biggest spender um, is um, Boston University, uh, who spent, which spent $760,000 to lobbying uh, firms uh, uh, to get uh, funds directly from Congress. But many of the others, uh, Harvard University, Columbia University, New York University, have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in lobbying efforts. Um, campaign contributions, and this is, this is what shocked me. Uh, when I saw this, uh, New York University gave $64,000 mostly to Democratic political candidates in order to make uh, their getting research money or, uh, easier. Um, Boston University spent $65,000. Uh, Harvard University is the champion here in political contributions, $188,000. Now, what point am I making? Um, the point I'm making is that while uh, America does have a large private university sector, uh, much of its privateness uh, has been bought off. Um, in the cases of the, uh, the first two cases, the state seeked, sought to directly repress uh, institutions, non-governmental institutions. The American way is to buy them off. And, uh, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, uh, you know, America is about making money, and, right? And uh, so, uh, in the American case, uh, increasingly private universities are becoming politicized in the efforts to obtain funding for various uh, uh, projects and proposals. They are increasingly dependent upon the state uh, for their financial survival. And this aspect of actual participation in the lobbying and political process is really just beginning, but I think it, it marks a, an important turning point in the politicization of American private universities. So, I think in the three examples uh, we saw, uh, we saw the heavy-handed approach uh, to institutions of civil society which created the threat of instability uh, in the political sphere. But we also see the uh, much more uh, probably effective uh, method that the American government has used to make sure in effect not that universities don't uh, have individuals advocating all sorts of ideas and things of that sort, but that even those individuals are still players in the political process. Uh, I was amazed a number of years ago, uh, <clears throat> it's nearly 20 now, uh, when Ronald Reagan first came into office and there was a, a large cut in the budget of the National Science Foundation, which funds economics. Suddenly, within, within days, 
uh, there were letters, uh, there was a, actually there was one main letter to the New York Times uh, signed by uh, uh, various market economists like Martin Feldstein and others saying, my God, how can you cut our budgets? How can you cut the National Science Foundation budget? Uh, economic research is important, it has external benefits. All of a sudden, uh, these people were in a panic over the loss of state funding. So, free market or not free market, uh, the American system has a way of ensuring that everybody plays the game. And I think it's another way that the institutions of civil society have been weakened, uh, not to the extent in my first two examples, but nevertheless, more, perhaps even more insidiously, because it's not so obvious, but it's nevertheless weakened by the activity of, of the state. So in conclusion, um, my, you know, three examples don't prove anything. But what they do show, I think, is that uh, throughout uh, various historical epochs, uh, the state has been very concerned about uh, the institutions uh, that are independent of it, uh, and, have, uh, and, and, ha and the state has uh, exercised a, uh, a watchful eye uh, because they understand that the, uh, the real alternative is the individual in, in conjunction with institutions of civil society. And if one can ensure that individuals are either atomistic, uh, isolated, or perfectly dependent upon the state, then the position of the state will be stronger and, and the position of, uh, of liberty will be uh, weaker. Yeah, beautiful. We are just on time. Thanks a lot. So, who is asking the first question? There are no candidates. Where are the, uh, the microphones? Yes, uh, Steve. Um, I, I find the picture you paint of American universities uh, very familiar, the situation in here in Europe, certainly in Britain, is even worse. But um, what I wonder is what you think can be done about this, because it seems to me that the, in the situation as it is, the incentive for people in private institutions such as universities and others to seek to gain advantage by cooperating with state power is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, it's like being presented with a honey pot, an open honey jar, and you would have to be extremely foolish, really, in terms of narrow definition of self-interest, not to stick your paw in the pot, so to speak. Uh, so what do you think about that? Can you think of any way of changing the institutional incentives so that the people in such private organizations, whether they be clubs or universities, have an incentive not, sorry, not to try and extract wealth from their fellow citizens in this way? Yeah. Um, it's interesting, uh, uh, they have, in this article, uh, John Silber, uh, the Chancellor of Boston University, uh, is prominently featured as a defender of this lobbying. Uh, uh, by the way, I have nothing against Boston University. <laughs> but um, nevertheless, uh, Silber um, says, well, people say it's dirty, it's unprofessional to go directly to Congress. He says, well, let them read the Constitution. Uh, we all have the right to go to Congress and, and, and ask for what we want. This is a free country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, I think what that illustrates is that there isn't, it isn't a, what that illustrates is that in a way it's been a miracle that it didn't happen until now, but that the uh, universities are in a position that's really no different from anybody else who has an interest and uh, decides to uh, spend uh, money on lobbying efforts uh, to promote that interest. So I think that the, uh, the answer, uh, if, you know, there isn't a unitary answer, but the answers uh, that will work in the case of universities have to be part and parcel of, of answers uh, that will work in terms of limiting the um, ability of the state uh, to um, finance uh, special interests across the board. And here the public choice uh, prescriptions I think are important. Uh, 
in terms of uh, one example, the idea that uh, uh, that uh, uh, spending legislation and taxing legislation perhaps should be subject to super majorities and at, the, at the federal level and things of that sort. Um, so I have no answers apart from the uh, general uh, prescriptions that uh, public choice economists have made in terms of constitutional uh, reform and reforming the rules of the game. I don't think you can expect that universities are going to uh, exercise some, um, uh, are going to be d denying themselves what is permitted to everyone else. I know, for example, NYU, uh, this is not at the federal level, but it's at the state level. Every uh, year when the appropriations are passed at the state level, uh, for uh, student loans and various other goodies that the university benefits from. They uh, hire buses to bring students up to Albany to uh, demonstrate in favor of uh, whatever the legislation is uh, to get the, get the money. And of course, there are students who, you know, love to do that kind of thing and they go and uh, and you know, and I don't know what else the university gives them. If, uh, you know, at NYU, you never can find out anything. I don't know how other universities are, but uh, you can never find out what's going on. But um, in any event, uh, so universities are not going to deny themselves what is permitted to everyone else. Okay. Yes, in the back row there. Just in the middle. Ah, that's George. George, I'm sorry, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> yes, uh, Mario. Uh, we're hearing your comments about the universities seeking government funds suggests an analogy with the the idea of school vouchers. Of course, many classical liberals favor vouchers uh, as an alternative to uh, the, the status quo in, in, uh, 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 in high schools and in other primary education. But your argument suggests that that actually would undermine these uh, civil aspects, this, this component of civil society. But what do you? say about that? Well, I wish I could be in favor of vouchers. Uh, it would be easy. Um, but what I worry about is uh, seeing time and time again when the state uh, directly or indirectly funds anything uh, that people then begin to say, well, you know, uh, this is, uh, we have, let me back up. We have this idea in the United States that any uh, a reduction in taxes or any um, exemption or, de or deduction is in a way a gift from the state to you. The implicit assumption is the state owns all the wealth and then uh, spends some of the wealth uh, on tax reduction or tax exemptions or on vouchers. So it, it will be very easy uh, in terms of the mentality that many Americans now have, or at least uh, American journalists have, to think of the vouchers as an expenditure of state money. And therefore, uh, you know, should it go just to any school or only schools that have meet certain requirements? And so what I worry about is that the voucher system will be the opening, door, or opening of the door to uh, a greater control of, uh, of private, um, ostensibly private uh, uh, educational institutions. Um, but I, I don't know, is there something more that you wanted me to connect with what I, I said in the, in the, in the talk? Or? Well, it, it seems like a more complicated case because with the vouchers, right, I mean, the way the way many people conceive of them, right, the voucher is, 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 is taking a given amount of taxation, right, but uh, uh, creating a greater freedom of choice as to how those funds can be applied. Uh, and viewed that way, it's, it's, in a sense, it's strengthening civil society or, or the institutions of civil society by creating alternatives, more viable alternatives to the government-run schools. 
And and all I'm the, the, the only point of my question is to is to suggest that there that there's a difficult tension here, because uh, I agree with your point that whenever the state is involved in funding anything, there's a danger of it uh, being able to manipulate and control what it funds, and in that sense, it undermines what might otherwise be a good uh, uh, a civil institution. On the other hand, the private private uh, primary schools can hardly get off the ground to a very significant extent, uh, given the the, the uh, fact that taxpayers have no choice but to fund uh, uh, government-run uh, institutions. So it seems to me you've got to hear a case where it's not clear what the best way to promote civil society is. Well, you know, when you, when you enter the realm of the second best, whether it's the second best uh, economically uh, or the second best uh, in some moral sense, uh, it's very difficult to uh, to set out uh, clear uh, rules and clear paths of behavior. Um, I would prefer uh, to the voucher, uh, the, the so-called tuition tax credit, which means that if you pay tuition to a school, you can uh, deduct that from your uh, 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 tax payments. Uh, the voucher is different in the sense that it's like a uh, government script or something that you're handed and it's worth a certain amount of money, and then you, you purchase educational services from it. Uh, the tuition tax credit is a little more indirect. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, the curious thing about uh, freedom is that when you mix it with other things, the other things have a way of taking over. And uh, so I don't have any uh, clear answer there. Um, but uh, I would prefer tuition tax credit to, uh, to vouchers. Yeah, Ian McKay. My name is Kostadin Yolmanov. I'm from. Where is he? Where are you speaking? Here. Where's the one? Ah, oh, okay. I'm from Bulgaria. Uh, it seems to me that this uh, distinguishing between uh, the state and other institutions is not very appropriate. I think that uh, the state itself is uh, a very uh, natural institution, and uh, the question for me is why. Uh, why the state is so powerful and, uh, and strong institution. Uh, and the reason f reasons for that, uh, uh, I think there is a, a very strong reasons for the state to be so powerful institution. The point you make is actually a very uh, complicated um, and uh, uh, profound point. Um, and I, I don't want to go uh, too far afield from what exactly you said, but it, it rings a lot of bells in my mind. Um, first of all, natural. Uh, there is a very interesting passage uh, from John Stuart Mill um, in, um, <clears throat> that's quoted in Henry Hazlitt's uh, Foundations of Morality, in which um, Mill um, in effect, uh, makes fun of the concept of natural. Uh, he talks about all sorts of horrible diseases and um, terrible uh, uh, events in human history. All of these, he says, are natural. Now, he's got a point. It's not the point he thought he had, but, there, there, it, but he's got a point. And the point is that the way a lot of people use the term natural uh, today uh, is it does not in any way Im uh, uh, imply or should not imply uh, good or beneficial. It just means that there are uh, laws of nature, okay, or, or laws of human behavior uh, which can explain or rationalize uh, things that happen. So in some sense the state is natural uh, in some sense, the totalitarian state is natural. The, uh, the, uh, the communist state is natural. Why? Because we can use uh, certain laws, uh, Mises would say praxeological laws, to understand how such institutions come into being and, and how they function and what they do to a society. So natural, in that sense, 
not in the natural law sense, uh, in the correct sense of na the natural law theorists, uh, but in the sense that Mill was using it, in the sense that a lot of people use it today, is, is, has nothing to do with good. It's just you know, the way the world works. But now we come to an interesting problem. And the interesting problem is that there is a tension in social science between the normative and the descriptive. It's, it, it clearly has come out in economics, especially, say, economics of institutions, um, in, the, in the form that uh, people say, well, if you can rationalize or if you can explain why a institution, the state or, or whatever, uh, arises, how it arises, why it's a, an efficient adaptation uh, to the environment uh, and to circumstances as they exist, uh, you have thereby justified it. Um, and this is an, an attention that is not new. It goes back, uh, Herbert Spencer got himself into a mess on this, uh, as, as well-meaning as he was. Uh, uh, but, uh, but it's especially acute problem now in the late 20th century. Um, so what I would say is this, uh, that in the sense of being able to understand why the state comes about and why totalitarian state comes about, why all sorts of social phenomena come about, they are explicable in terms of natural or praxeological laws. Uh, but that's not the same thing as saying that they're desirable. Um, from a moral perspective. Mario, I'm, I'm disturbed by um, your talk, and it reminds me of something else that appeared in the New York Times a few months ago on a weekend edition, um, which was about the question of how we decide what quality of university work we want. What, what quality of university work we want. Normally, um, private American universities cover most of their running costs and more through tuition fees. And you would normally have thought that the quality of a service is determined by what the customers are willing to pay for it. If you now cover most of your running costs through tuition fees, that mechanism, that test seems to be satisfied. If you go for more money, government money, Presumably that buys higher excellence. Now, how, where is the test to s determine how much excellence we want, as opposed to um, reductions in the teaching loads of professors or some other rent-seeking object? Um, I don't know exact figures, uh, but I know that the, major the, the major part, the majority of the budget of NYU, private university, uh, they call themselves, uh, because sometimes people, especially non-Americans, think that New York University is the same thing as the City University of New York. You see, a slight difference in name is all the difference in the world. The City University of New York is a public university, but New York University is a private university, as they say, in the public service. I, I didn't like that when they started doing that, P private universities. Why can't they just say it's a private university in the city of New York or something like that? But it's in the public service. Okay, so I'm a public servant. Um, but, you know, um, the majority of its budget, it does not come from tuition. Foundation grants, of course, are important, but there is uh, uh, d d also, if, even if you include tuition, I mean, how do people pay tuition? Uh, there are all sorts of uh, federally guaranteed loans. Does that count as private money? I mean, when in fact you're able to borrow money at, at much below market rates of interest uh, in order to pay the tuition. Um, so the idea, surely the, uh, the universities operate in a market. Uh, but a mar market and markets are not all the same. I mean, there are markets uh, which reflect uh, uh, the um, uh, demands of uh, different constituencies. Um, you know, who uh, are my colleagues uh, working for in my department, say? Who am I working for? Uh, I'll be quite honest with you. I do not think of myself as working for the students. I think of myself as working for Austrian economics, whatever that means. And I have to teach these students because then I don't, I, I, otherwise I won't get a paycheck. And you know, I, I like eating and 
going places. Um, but I never think of myself, in fact, the whole concept, if a student were to come up to me and say, I pay your salary, I mean, I, that would, that would be like the, the, the mortal sin. I mean, I, I would never forgive the student for saying such an uh, <laughs> impertinent thing like that. First of all, he doesn't pay my salary. And secondly, the whole attitude is that we're, among all the faculty, we're not working for the student. We have to do this. Uh, who are we working for? We're working for our peers. We're working for others in the profession. Uh, we're working for those others who consume the ideas that we produce. Uh, how is this possible? Well, the state uh, is a large part of the reason why we have that luxury. And um, so, you know, what determines excellence in that context? Well, now certainly with the direct lobbying, you can't argue that it's the board of expert advisors. We need the, uh, what was the, the name of the person, the, so, the, the uh, metaphysical advisor, was that? <laughs> okay, I want to bring a case under consideration. Poland does have a private university established in 1918 uh, which survived the war and the communist system. This is the Catholic University of Lublin. And a few years ago, uh, the, the university uh, never took even one single zloty from the communist government. When we have that change, uh, then there was an issue of whether the Catholic University should take money, and there was a big discussion whether it would involve uh, or subject the university to the governmental authorities. The answer of the rector and the senate uh, who decided to take some money covering certain part of uh, expenses was that this is not a grace or benefit which we are taking from the government. This is a restitution uh, because uh, there are no other mechanisms by which parents or students can deduct the money that they are paying anyway to the government. So this is the, this is the thing that, so to speak, getting back what we paid in an in a, uh, indirect way. I mean, if there were other mechanisms, but we don't have. And uh, it would not be possible to cover through tuition, taking into account that a uh, salary of a average person is about $300. So it's a hard case. When, when you first uh, started to tell the story, I thought what you were saying was uh, restitution for the oppression that the communist government placed the Catholic Church under all these years, and now they're getting, but you mean, some, you mean a, a refund of the, of the taxes. Um, you know, uh, uh, see, this is the problem. This is exactly the problem is that there are all, given the state's involvement uh, in uh, civic life, uh, the life of the, of the people uh, to a great extent, there become then many rationalizations uh, for additional involvements or uh, modifications of the involvement. Uh, so, given that the state, uh, say, takes a, a, a certain amount in taxes, uh, then people can legitimately argue, well, I'm just getting my tax money back. I knew a student at the University of Chicago when I was uh, a student there uh, years ago um, who hadn't held a job uh, uh, in the private sector in his life, but immediately started working for the state of Illinois. And he said he was getting his tax money back. And uh, so I asked him, well, what tax money? You never had a, a job. What tax money are you getting back? He says, I'm getting my tax money back in advance <laughs> for when I get a job in the private sector. This is the problem. I mean, this is why there is something you know, known as the slippery slope, et cetera, is because interventions lead to very reasonable, respectable rationalizations for further intervention, and we go down the road. And I don't know what to say about any, you know, given that there's a certain situation in place, 
then it, you know, it, it is reasonable for individuals in certain circumstances then to, to uh, demand their share. Uh, but uh, it's reasonable in one sense, and uh, of course, uh, in the collective sense, it uh, produces the result that the civil society is co-opted or dominated by the state. Okay, well, thanks. Ça marche ou ça marche pas? Oui, ça marche. Well, good, uh, thanks to, to Mario and to everybody. Uh,